Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Um, that just say YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel. Okay, guys, so this video, um, as you can see, it's not a regularly scheduled videos. You know, all of my videos that are regularly scheduled, they come out every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, this is just a bonus, it's an extra. So on this video, guys, I want to talk to you about this next generation NCLEX, okay? This is going to be a part one out of a part two, maybe even a part three series because there are some things I wanna to talk to you about. I'm just not free to talk about them yet. So some things I am holding back, but I will be discussing them on the part two. And there are some things that I would like to talk to you about, but I don't like talking to, talking to you guys about something unless I'm solid on it, I'm 100%. And there's some things that are still in the works and there's some things I just still don't understand. Like I need more training on. And so I'm not trying to bring it to you until I feel like I'm fully competent, then I'll bring it to you. So there's definitely going to be a part two, or maybe even a part three. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some information with you, but this is not something that, um, has been released for me to be able to actually show you. So it's not something you're gonna be able to see, but this is information that I can share with you just for, uh, excuse me, copyright purposes. I just can't um, uh, visibly show it to you, but it's a lot, we'll talk. Anyway, um, so let's get started. The first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about, and so I'm warning you now, guys, like I said, I'm not showing you anything. I'm talking to you. I think part two, I'm going to be able to show you some information. But just so you know, that's what this is. So you know in advance. Don't give me a thumbs down, guys. I warned you in advance. It's not my fault. All right. So um, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is the timeline when you expect to see this new generation of NCLEX. Everyone's been talking about it. And it's going to roll out. It's set, it's scheduled to roll out April of 2023, April next year. However, some things I want you to know. April of this year, so that means next month, guys. Next month, the NCSBN, and this is the organization that actually creates the NCLEX, they're in charge of the NCLEX, okay? They are going to select participants such as um, uh, members of the nurse regulatory board staff, stakeholders in the measurement world and others, certain people that they handpick, okay? Next month, they're going to be taking this exam and what they're going to do is provide feedback to NCSBN for in preparation of the rollout for next year, April, 2022, okay? So April, next month, selected people are going to take this exam. They're gonna see what these questions look like and they're gonna offer feedback. December, 2022. So December of this year, the live beta testing begins. So what that is, the live beta testing, it's gonna take place where actual candidates who are expected to graduate next year, April, 2023, they're going to take that test. The test is not gonna count. The whole purpose of it is to see how these students do and of course to get feedback. So next month, let's go back. Next month, handpicked people are gonna take this test to provide feedback. But in December of this year, students that are scheduled to graduate April of next year are going to be taking this test. And it's not gonna count, but it's gonna provide a lot of relevant information for NCSBN, things that they need to change, and just to see how the students do, because one of the things that um, they initially um, predicted or they thought was gonna happen, they thought that the students were gonna take forever and a day to answer these um, case study type questions. And what they found, the students are really taking about a minute and a half to two minutes more than uh, the regular um, uh, other questions. And so what they found is, or what they think, the reason for that is that they're just building on top of the case study that they had before they're building from that knowledge. So they're learning a lot from uh, the people who are taking the test and providing feedback. So uh, December of this year, students who are supposed to graduate April of next year are gonna be taking the test, provide feedback, it's not gonna count. And then next year, April, 2023, it's the real deal. 
it's rolling out, it's going to count. So that's that. What else did I want to talk to you guys about? Okay. So the whole reason that this thing has happened, I mean, there's been a lot of reasons, but the biggest one that I've been told is that um, they're realizing that uh, many new grads are lacking clinical judgment. And so there's been a lot of medical errors that have happened and just a lot of mistakes that have been made. And so they, they really want to make sure that you, as a student that's taking this test, have that minimum competence. So they really, uh, most of these questions are geared towards that clinical judgment. When you're given a situation, can you recognize that something's wrong. Can you recognize what's wrong? Do you know what your nursing intervention should be? And besides knowing what those nursing interventions should be, are you able to prioritize those nursing interventions? Do you know what the expected outcome for those nursing interventions should be? Do you know what kind of expected outcomes that you should look for? And if you don't see it, what you do next? All of that they're looking for, okay? So let's talk about um, clinical judgment. Like I said, that's focusing on prioritization. And guys, I've made so many priority videos for you. And I've been telling you how important priority is. And I didn't know what they were going to do on this new test, but I knew that priority was going to be a huge component of it. And it absolutely is. So if you guys are struggling with priority, you're struggling with delegation, you better go back and watch all those videos I did on priority because they're going to kill you on those type of uh, um, content and subject matters. I'm, I'm telling you now. All right, so clinical judgment students, they can improve their skills by prioritizing care and understanding prioritizing setting framework. So in doing so, they'll improve their clinical um, judgment skills. So the priority setting frameworks, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six things, very important, very big on, and I've taught on all of these, some more than others. I'm gonna tell you what they are. Um, have a pen and paper ready, write this down. First one, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How many times have I rammed this down your throat? It's still super, super important, especially in priority, okay? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Remember uh, that pyramid. What is most important? Physiological integrity. You can't miss that, guys. Nutrition, fluid and electrolyte, rest, sleep, glucose, um, ABC, circulation, hemodynamic status, anything, uh, vital signs, anything that is physiologically keeping that patient alive and breathing, okay, that is a physiological integrity, and you're expected to understand that that, that takes priority over anything else, okay? What else? The nursing process, ADPI, your assessment skills, when you're walking into a room and you see your patient, you, you're in that clinical setting, um, can you recognize, before you even say anything to that patient, just looking at that patient, can you recognize um, deviations from the normal, right? So um, assessment, uh, planning your interventions, actually performing those interventions, evaluating those interventions, and if the outcome wasn't what it was supposed to be, you do what? You go back to assessment. So add pi. Airway breathing circulation. How many times have I told you with NCLEX, not only NCLEX, honestly, guys, um, nursing exams, period, 95, 96% of these questions really boil down to one of those three, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, add pi, or ABC, right? So we have those three, but there are more. Safety and risk reduction. So safety and re risk reduction. So, okay. Physiological integrity, patients alive, they're breathing, their vital signs are stable. They're physiologically, we got that. What's next? We need to keep them safe. So one of the big things, and it's going to continue to be a very big thing is one of the safety, what, like what falls, right? Isn't that huge safety concerns app concern? Absolutely. Or preventing, uh, medical errors. Next, least restrictive versus um, least invasive. And I've said this to you a million times, guys. In nursing, 
we always go, want to go from the least restrictive measure and then go to invasive, okay? Um, so for example, you walk into a patient's room and they're having trouble breathing, what's the first thing you're gonna do? Well, if they're lying down, they're supine, before you grab the oxygen or do anything else, the least restrictive, and it takes two seconds is what? Elevate the head of the bed. As soon as you elevate that patient's head of the bed, that does what? Gravity helps with that diaphragm, pushes it down so the lungs can expand. The lungs not fighting with gravity as much trying to expand. It's something simple and it's, it's, um, it's not restrictive and it's not invasive, okay? So you guys have to understand that concept. Acute versus chronic. When it comes to priority, you're always going to prioritize that patient that's acutely ill versus a chronically ill. That patient that has something going on with them right now, right now, we need to fix that right now versus the patient that's stable, but you know, they've had diabetes for a while, they've had high cholesterol for a while, or they ha they've had hypertension for a while, but it's not affecting them right now. So you really wanna deal with the patient that has something actively wrong with them in that moment. That's acute. So you're always gonna prioritize the patient that's acute versus the patient that's chronic. You're going to uh, prioritize that patient that is unstable versus that patient that's stable. That makes sense. If the patient's stable, if you get a question to ask you, which patient are you going to see first? You're not going to choose the one that's lying down in their bed reading a magazine. You're going to choose the one that's having difficulty breathing or the ones, the one that just has surgery and they're exhibiting signs and symptoms of hemorrhage or signs and symptoms of infection. The one that's going, something's going on with them actively, so the one that's stable the one that's stable, the one that is unstable versus the one that's stable and urgent versus non-urgent. So uh, let me get comfortable here. Um, you're going to prioritize that patient that has something urgently going on with them. So if you have to choose between a patient that has a sodium level of 142, I'm lying, a sodium level of 150 and a patient that has signs and symptoms of a stroke. Who are you gonna choose? That patient that has signs and symptoms of a stroke. Why? Because a patient that's exhibiting symptoms of a stroke, that's urgent. As a matter of fact, you know, this is time sensitive, right? We gotta get that TPA, depending on the kind of stroke that uh, uh, is going on with that patient. So this is time sensitive, this is urgent. So those you really have to focus on. I'm gonna repeat that again. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The nursing process, which is your ADPI, your airway breathing circulation. And remember guys, it goes in that order. Why? Because um, how's that patient gonna breathe if there's not, an open airway, right? The only time it doesn't go in that order is obviously when you're doing CPR. So that's number three. Number four, safety and risk reduction. I want you to think of falls, um, medication errors, things like that. Number five, least restrictive versus least um, invasive. And number six, acute versus chronic, your stable versus your unstable, your urgent versus your non-urgent. All right. So some priority setting questions you can ask yourself to try to figure out. You can ask yourself, uh, which of the following actions should I take first? Which of the following assessment findings uh, would I find in an older adult? Which should they be? Let me talk to you guys about this. And I've talked to you about this before, but this is very important, especially if you're testing in the state states that have a lot of older adults, such as Florida, such as New York, such as California, you know, there's a very heavy uh, geriatric population. You have to understand the difference in what you'd find in a normal healthy adult versus a geriatric patient. For example, in the older adult, what's the first sign and symptoms of infection that you normally would see? A change in their level of consciousness, right? Confusion. So things like that, you can ask yourself, which of the following uh, patients would I assess first? Which patient is more urgent? Which patient is more acute? Uh, which of the following is the next action? Okay, after I figure out what my 
primary nursing intervention is going to be, what am I going to do next? All of that's what? Prioritization, guys. All of that falls under prioritizing um, not only that patient problem, but what you're going to do about that problem. Okay, so um, trying to figure out how to word this. So like I said, with uh, Maslow's, you absolutely have to know everything that falls under Maslow's. I gave you that list. There's more. Make sure you know what physiologically keeps a patient alive. That's one, right? So let's say you have a test question and the Maslow's is taken care of. What's the next thing you're going to be concerned about? Well, make sure you know that um, pyramid. Because Maslow's most important, Maslow's, um, physiological integrity on the bottom, that's the foundation, that's what's most important, but next is what? Safety. We need to keep um, that patient safe, safety and security. So um, safety and security would be like that patient's um, personal security, um, having somewhere to live, having a job, all that good stuff, um, employment, but health, right? But between those two, between physiological integrity and safety and security, what's going to be our priority? Physiological integrity. Um, airway, breathing, circulation. I talked to you guys about that. The only thing I would say, and I'm going to say this again because you guys will get stuck. You guys can get a test question that includes, you know, the airway and the breathing. If you have to choose one, you're gonna have what? O open that airway because how that pay pay how is that patient going to be able to breathe if there is no airway? If that airway is occluded, okay? The only time that circulation comes before the airway and breathing is during what? CPR. All right, safety and risk reduction. Now I, took, I gave you example about falls. Um, let me give you guys an example about the medication. So you have a patient that's going through alcohol um, intoxication. No, I'm lying. They're going through withdrawal. By the way, guys, any patient going through alcohol withdrawal, um, that can be life-threatening. You have to watch them very closely because that patient can go into seizures. All right, so you're going to be watching that patient very carefully. Um, what would be a priority medication or something that you give to that patient? And the an answer would be lorazepam. Why? You have to show that you understand that um, a big concern with alcohol withdrawal is them going into uh, seizures, and that is a drug of choice that you give for that type of situation. And that falls under. Um, um, risk reduction. What risk are we reducing that patient going into seizures? All right, nursing process. What is a nursing process? That is our ADPI, assessment, diagnosis, planning, intervention, and evaluation. So for um, this um, next gen and CLEX, the ADPI stays the same, but for the LPNs, if you're if you're testing for PN, you know how for the RN you have the assessment, planning, intervention, assessment, ADPI assessment, nursing diagnosis, planning, intervention, evaluation. Well, for the PN, they're going to focus more guys on. They're not calling it assessments, calling data collection, right? So collecting data, planning what you're going to do with that data implementing your in, um, nursing interventions and of course evaluation least rest least restrictive to and least invasive so i talked to you guys already about um the least invasive where you want to do something that's easy, that doesn't puncture the patient's body. You're not going into the body. You always want to do least invasive to most invasive. Let's talk about the least restrictive. Let me explain what that means. So for example, let's say you get a situation where you're the psych nurse and a patient's starting to demonstrate um, behaviors of, they're not being aggressive, but you can see they're starting to escalate, right? So what would be um, 
least uh, uh, restrictive. You can talk to that patient first and say, hey, you know, I noticed you're starting to get a little aggravated. What's going on? Or, hey, why don't we go for a walk and you walk with them down the hall or you go outside and walk with them into an open garden? right? That's not, that's not restrictive. You're not locking them in the room. You're not putting them in, um, what's that called? What you need orders for. You're not putting them in restraints. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say least rest um, restrictive, you always want to try to go from least restrictive before restrictive. And when I say um, restraints, I mean um, physical restraints or chemical restraints. I talked to you guys about the acute versus chronic, unstable versus stable, urgent versus non-urgent. We talked about that. Okay, let's talk about survival, survival potential. Um, maybe two or three Zooms ago, I talked to you guys about this. When you're testing and they're asking you which patient you're going to see first, you're gonna go see the patient that's in most danger, right? The patient that needs help the most. That's for normal situations. But if you get a situation where it's um, mass casualty, something happened, there was some type of explosion, right? Your thinking has to switch. You're gonna to try to save as many people as possible. So you're gonna to try to save those who are most likely to live than those who are most likely to die. And I know that sounds horrible, but for testing purposes, guys, that's how you have to think or you're going to get it wrong. So if you're in the hospital, you're the triage nurse, you're working on the floor, you want to see the patient with the most problems, the one that's more likely to die, you want to run to them first. But if you're given a question where it's some type of mass casualty, it's the opposite. The patient who's better off, most likely to live, that's who you're going to see first. So um, let's talk about this briefly, survival potential. This is a triage system used during mass casualty events to determine the priorities of care for all injured patients. So here are the triage categories. Write this down, okay? If the patient is a gray triage tag color. Here's who you would give a gray tag color to. This is expected or urgent. So listen to this, guys. The victim is not likely to survive. We are not expecting them to survive. So there's been a mass casualty. You get on the scene and you see a crowbar through the person's brain and they're still like this, they're twitching, but that crowbar is right there through the brain. You're not expecting them to live, okay? That person is gonna be getting palliative care and pain relief should be provided, but they're not expected to live. That's the patient that's gonna be gray triage tag color. That's the tag color that they're gonna get, gray. You're not expecting them to survive. Next, red triage tag color. You're giving that red tag to the person with urgent slash immediate need. This victim can be helped by immediate intervention, but they have to get transfer, transported like to a hospital or facility very soon and includes compromises to the patient's airway, breathing, circulation. That's red. Next is yellow. This is the emergent or delayed. Victims transport can be delayed, so they're not that bad as the red. So they the transportation to the hospital can be delayed. Include serious and potentially life-threatening injuries, but their status is not expected to deteriorate over several hours. So, you know, even if we don't get them to a hospital within a couple hours, we're not expecting them to die, right? That's the patient that would get the yellow triage tag, tag color. And last is the green green triage tag color. This is a non-urgent, the patient with the very minor injuries. They've got minor injuries. Their status is not likely to go down or deterior deteriorate within the next couple, not even hours, the next couple days. And they're able to take care of themselves as far as, you know, walking around, even if they're wounded. 
guess what? When it comes to mass casualties, the one that's in the green zone, that's the one you go to. So think of green for go. The one who is most likely to survive. So you're going to see that green, uh, the, the patient that or victim that you give the green tag to, that's who you'd help first. Who are you going to help next? The person that you give the yellow tag to. Who would you help next after that? Red and last is gonna be the gray, the one that you're not expecting to survive anyhow. And I know it sounds horrible, but that's how you have to think, guys. Let's see, I'm done with time. Okay, so, let's skip that for a second. Um, this new, um, the NCLEX next gen guys, it's not an entirely new test. I, actually, most of the test is the same as it's always been. So follow me on this. Follow me on this. The next generation NCLEX is going to show 70 to 135 scored items based on the test takers ability. So the least that you can have is 70. I'm talking about for RN, if your LPN 85, okay? The least that you're gonna get is 70 if you're LPN 85. And the most that you're gonna get is 135. If you're testing for PN 150. So again, least 70, most 135 if you're testing for PN, least 85, most 150. But out of that total, so let's talk about this, the case studies, whether you're studying for uh, PN or RN, you're all going to get the same amount of case studies, okay? You're going to get three case studies, but in those three case studies, there are six things that they're going to question you on. And I'm going to talk to you about those six things shortly. So that three times six is 18. So whether you're testing for RN, you're testing for PN, you are guaranteed to get 18 uh, next-gen questions on those case studies. You're going to get three case studies, but out of those threes, for each of those case studies, you're going to get uh, six questions that are testing you for something in particular. And I'm going to talk about that shortly. Um, each candidate will have three case studies. Each case study will present six items. I'm going to talk to you about the six items shortly. And that's what gives you your 18 clinical judgment items. Every candidate, every, I can't speak. Every candidate will also um, answer a minimum of 52 knowledge-based items. That 52 knowledge-based items, guys, those are the 52 items, 52 questions that NCLEX has been having. So all those videos that I've been producing for you, NCLEX, 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 all of you are going to have at least 52 of those, okay? So those 52 of the same NCLEX that they, we've been giving plus that 18, okay? So every candidate will also answer a minimum of 52 knowledge-based items, total 18 clinical items. So your 52 plus your 18, that's what gives you your minimum of the 70, all right? So most of the NCLEX that you're gonna be taking, even if you're taking that new generation, most of it is still gonna be the original NCLEX that they were giving before, all right? 18 of those are going to be new. And when I say 18, guys, 18 is a minimum that you can get. What do I mean by that? If you know your stuff, that computer shutting down on you, you got your 18, you're good to go. Or you're doing horrible, so horrible, the computer knows you're not going to pass, it shuts off on you, you got that 18. But if this is the passing name, passing, um, whatever, passing line, right? And you're testing, you're doing good, then you're doing bad. You're doing good, then you're doing bad. You're doing good, then you're doing bad. And the computer's not sure about you, so you have to keep going. You absolutely can get more of these questions. And those questions are no joke, okay? So um, that's that. What else did I want to tell you? Oh, also, guys, you're going to have 15... Another 15 questions when you're done with your test, regardless, you're going to get 
15 questions and those 15 questions are not going to count. What they are for are for NCSBN to see, okay, are these good questions for us to add to the batch or should we get rid of them? So once, you know, remember this is a computer adaptive test. So this is a passing, you're going like this or you've consistently been up here or you've been consistently been down here, whichever it is, when your test is over and you're done, it's gonna give you 15 more, but those 15 more that it gives you does not count. It's strictly for NCSBN to get feedback about those questions and figure out if they should add it to the, their pool of questions or get rid of them. All right. After answering your initial 70 items, because remember 70 is the minimum that you can answer and the computer shuts off on you. Whether you, you, this is passing, you did so good, you hit that 70, the computer realized, even if you go to the end, consistently you've been doing good, you're gonna pass, it shuts off. Or you've been consistently doing bad, then you hit that 70 and the computer's like, okay, this person can make it to the end and they're still gonna fail. Either way, either way, if you've been consistent with it, either way, and that computer shuts off on you on that 70, okay? He or she will be asked additional questions. Those are the 15 questions that I told you about that's not going to count. That's just feedback for NCSBN. Most of these will be knowledge-based, but about 10% will focus on clinical judgment in the form of standalone questions. And when it says standalone, that means it's not going to be a case study. It's just going to be a, a question that's knowledge-based, okay? The maximum number of questions then will be 135. Why? Because you're adding the 15 questions that don't count. You still have to do them. They just don't count. Oh, by the way, you'll have five hours to take the test. Okay, some important things to remember about this test. Um, it's a computer adaptive test. So it's basically, it's artificial intelligence that's figuring out, do you know your stuff? Do you know it or don't you know it? Um, sorry, I can't see. So when an item's answered, the computer estimates the candidate's ability based on all the previous answers. And usually what happens, so this is passing, right? They'll start you off with a question. And if you do well, it gets harder. 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 Then you start getting answers wrong. It gets easier. It gets easier. It gets easier. It gets easier. Remember, guys, this is passing, but then you start getting it right again. It gets harder. It gets harder. And so they're trying to see that consistency. Are you consistently doing below what's passing or are you consistently doing above what's passing? The computer selects the next item. Excuse me. The computer selects the next item. The candidate should have a 50% chance of answering correctly. So it's not biased against you. The computer's estimate of the candidate's ability becomes more precise as more items are answered. The more items that you're answering, the more that that computer is able to figure you out and figure if you know your stuff or not, depending on how you're answering these questions. When the computer establishes the candidate's ability, it shuts off, whether it's passing or fail. So the cut score. This is the cut point along an ability range that marks the minimum aptitude that's required to safely and effectively practice nursing. And that's just that bar that I was telling you about, that cutoff. If you get to 70 and you've been consistently um, up here long enough, it'll cut off on 70 and pass versus if you've been consistently down here, you know, you might go up once in a while, but consistently, you know, you've been down here, it'll shut off and you uh, fail. Again, 70 to 135 if you're testing for RN, 85 to 150 if you're testing for PN. Differences between the NCLEX and the new generation NCLEX. So let's talk about what's not going to change first. What's not going to change? The exam will continue measure the same critical content areas. That means all of those videos I've made for you already about content that is important for you to know for NCLEX, that doesn't change. They still want you to know 
those signs and symptoms of an MI, what you're going to do for an MI. They still want you to know those medications. They still want you to know the contraindications. They still want you to know those nursing interventions. They still want you to know when you're going to call the doctor because there's nothing else you can do for that patient. There's no choice. You have to call the doctor versus um, when you can do something for your patient. That does not change. Let me tell you what does, well, let me, I'm, let me tell you now. Let me tell you one of the things that do change. You know how I would show you tricks where you know you don't know the answer, but you can still get the answer, right? On the 52 questions that's still the NCLEX part of it, you can still use those tricks. But baby, <laughs> those 18 new, new um, generation NCLEX questions, not so much. Why? Let me tell you, they're testing you to see not only do you have the nursing intervention or what you should have done for that patient, but do you know why you chose that as your answer? So it's, it's a process. So not only are you giving the nursing intervention, what you're going to do for that patient, but they want to see, do you know why? So you can't use those strategies that I gave you on, you know, the other 52 questions that you'd be able to use because you have to draw from those cues and be able to analyze those cues in, or in a, in order to interpret those cues to get you to your nursing intervention and then look for your expected outcomes, okay? All right, so anyway, let's talk about what does not change. So the content of what they expect you to know, that stays the same. Most of the items on the minimum length exam will be your standard and collects items. So you need to try your best guys if you're taking that new generation NCLEX, knock it out the ballpark. So as soon as that computer is able to shut off on you, whether it's 70 or 85, then it shuts off on you. So you don't have to worry about getting more of those NCLEX generate uh, new, uh, I'm gonna call it NGN because it's too long for me to say. NGN, when I say NGN, I'm talking about the new generation NCLEX, okay? Try your best to knock it out the ballpark. Why? I'm going to say this again. Most items on the minimum length exam is going to be your standard NCLEX, okay? If you do well, that shuts off. As soon as it can shut off, you're only going to get that 18. Remember, whether you're testing for RN or PN, you're still going to get the 18, but at least there'll be 18 and not more. Um, what else stays the same? The exam is remains computer adaptive where it's looking to see how well you're doing and it'll figure out if you passed or not, depending on how you answer the test. That stays the same. Let's talk about what changes. What changes is that each of you are gonna see um, new item types. You're gonna see drag and drops. You're going to see, you might get questions such as, they'll give you a situation and they'll give you a nursing, a um, uh, couple of nursing interventions, and they'll ask you which nursing intervention is contraindicated, right? And you click on the one that's contraindicated. Maybe you guess you got that right. Great. But then they tell you to highlight, take your mouse and highlight in the um, case study the reason why that nursing intervention was contraindicated. How are you going to BS that? So you really have to know your stuff, guys. And um, I don't have too many teachings I have on here on uh, YouTube besides, you know, the questions and answers that I go over with you. But I have plenty on my website, Nexus Nursing Institute. If you are weak in pathophysiology, because that's what it basically boils down to, you have to understand the pathophysiology for you to understand those cues, for you to understand those nursing interventions. You better check out my audio lessons. It's on my website. Don't say I didn't warn you. So anyway, um, what changes, you're going to see those new items where you have to drag and drop, select all, multiple select all that applies, um, where you will hear a sound and they may give you a table or a figure illustration and you have to point and click to where that sound's coming for, from or the type of sound that you're listening to. Um, there's a list of them. Also, here's something that changes. This is good. Remember NCLEX before, you either got it right or you wrong. You got it wrong, even with the select all that applies. Well, now you can get partial credit. And here's how it works. So let's say you have a select all that applies and they give you four choices, right? And you get 
two out of the choices correct, but you chose one you shouldn't have chosen. You get points for the two, and then they take away points for the one you got wrong. So it's partial credit. Now, the way they do the math, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. Honestly, that's one of the things that I really need to go um, get another training because I haven't figured that out yet. As soon as I find out, I'll let you know. But I do know you get partial credit and that's how they do it. They give you points for the ones you got right, but then they take away points for the ones that you get wrong. What else changes? Standalone items. So two standalone items are gonna be offered. You have the bow tie and the trend. That is something else, guys. <laughs> For hours, I tried to figure out this bow tie and trend of um, making this type of question. And I have not yet. That's another uh, thing that on my next training, I'm really gonna focus on because the only way I know I can help you to the best of my ability when it comes to these NGN is to really be skilled in writing these types of questions so that I can produce them for you. And so you guys can practice, but I'm not there yet. But anyway, two standalone items are going to be offered, bow, uh, bow tie and trend. I'm getting a training on that. As soon as I've got it down, I'll let you guys know. Candidates who continue beyond, listen to this, guys. Ooh. Candidates who continue beyond the minimum length exam may receive as much as 10% of these items on the rest of their exam. And please, guys, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to scare you. But I do want you to have a sense of how important it is to know your stuff. If you um, have a chance to take your NCLEX before this NGN rolls out in April of 2023. Take it. And when I say take it, like, you know, if you studied, you know your stuff, don't be scared and wait for this one to roll out. Now, if you know you don't know your stuff, don't go waste your money, guys, because you're going to fail and say Professor D made you go take this test. No. But if you have the chance to take that test before this, thing's roll, this thing rolls out and you're feeling pretty confident, put in that work, study, and take your chance and take it before this thing rolls out, okay? Oh, excuse me, guys. Um, so anyway, let me repeat that. Candidates who continue beyond the minimum length. So if that computer does not shut off on you at the minimum time that it can, there is a chance that you get this bow tie and trend, bow tie or trend, or you can get several of them. And like I said, guys, I haven't even figured this out yet. I'll let you know when I do. Um, partial credit scoring, I talked to you guys about that. Candidates will receive full, partial, or no credit for an answered for an answer based on the selected response. So that's a good thing because it used to, used to either get it right or you got it wrong. All right, new item types on NGN. I'm going to list them for you, but this is actually going to be part of my second video where I go into detail about each of the item types. And the reason why I'm not doing it in this video, some of them I'm still kind of confused on and I don't want to give you uh, misleading information or wrong information. So I'm just going to name them for you now. But once I get a grasp on all of them, that'll be part of my part two. So the types that you'll see, there'll be multiple choice, multiple response, um, your drag and drop, close rationale, your uh, table, text, highlight. That's to name a few. What are standalone uh, item what are standalone item types? Those are the questions, guys, that you'll get that is not connected to a case study. It's just a question that stands by itself that's knowledge based. Okay. However, I do have some questions about those standalones and I haven't gotten an answer yet. So I'm working on that. And that also will be part of my part two when I make a part two video for you. Okay. With all of that being said, let me jump back to what I had originally skipped. You remember how I told you you're going to get three case studies, and on those three case studies, you're going to be asked six different things, or they'll test you on six different things, and that's how you end up getting 18 questions. Three times six is 18, right? Let's talk about those six different things. Here's what you're going to be 
um, questioned on when it comes to each of those three case studies. Write this down, guys. It's important. Recognizing cues, analyzing cues, prioritizing hypotheses, generating solutions, taking actions, and evaluating outcomes. I'm going to repeat that, then we'll talk about it. I'm going to explain it. One, recognizing cues. Two, analyzing cues. Three, prioritizing hypotheses. Four, generating solutions. Five, taking action. Six, evaluating outcomes. So for each of those three case studies you're going to get, they're going to ask you about each of these. So let's talk about the first one, recognizing cues. In the case study, and it's, it's not just one or two sentences, guys. It's a couple paragraphs. Some of them even have tabs you have to click on just like you would in the MAR where you look at the meds, where you look at the patient's history, where you look at the nursing notes, all of that, okay? This is a full case study. So you're gonna be given that information and recognizing cues. This is what sticks out to you that makes you understand what's going on with your patient and makes you already understand there, in your back of your mind, there's certain things you're gonna have to be doing with, for this patient. So these are clues that helps you identify the problem, okay? Recognizing cues are the things that you see in the case study that helps you identify the problems that are happening with the patient. Next, um, analyzing cues. Analyzing cues, guys, in simple terms, that's linking the cues that you found in the case study and linking them to the clinical situation and figuring out what's wrong with your patient. Okay, so um, let's go back to recognizing cues. Recognizing cues are the things you see that makes you realize something wrong with your patient. It could be um, an abnormal vital sign. It could be a patient history where they tell you that the patient um, is an alcoholic. They have a history of alcoholism, right? Why would that be a cue to you right now if the patient's in the hospital? What if that patient's about to go to surgery? What do we know about alcoholism and surgery? We don't want that patient bleed out on the table, right? So that is a cue to you. Or a cue may be a dig level that, you know, you, you looked on the MAR, you saw the patients on digoxin, and then when you looked at the at their dig level, you saw it was 3.5. That's a cue. So uh, recognizing cues, that those are things that just lets you know something's wrong with the patient analyzing the cues that's linking the cues that you saw that something's wrong with the patient and that helps you realize okay what's my nursing intervention going to be you start formulating that idea in your head prioritizing hypotheses that's prioritizing each problem because trust me in that big old case study you're going to get three of them and they're all big that patient's going to have more than one problem they're going to have several problems and so for three, prioritizing hypotheses, that's really prioritizing the, the problems. So one problem may be that, you know, um, their sodium slightly elevated, and another problem will see that their glucose is significantly low. Out of those two, which one's a priority? That low glucose, because what kills somebody faster, high blood sugar or high, low blood sugar? Low blood sugar. And a low blood sugar will kill somebody way faster than the um, sodium being high or low. You see what I'm saying? So you're going to have a whole bunch of problems, but you're going to have to prioritize those problems, which one's more important. And that's prioritizing the hypotheses. Next, generate solutions. What's my plan? What am I going to do to fix this problem? Right? If it's the hypoglycemia, um, hypoglycemia, you're going to give patients some glucose, right? If it's hyperglycemia, patients um, um, has hyperglycemia, the blood sugar is up, you're going to give them insulin. So what is it that you plan on doing for your patient? Next, take action. It's not as easy as taking the action. You have to actually prioritize your action because in the case studies that they give you, you're going to be doing more than one thing for the patient. You may have to elevate the head of the bed, give them oxygen, 
um, give them a medication, call the doctor. But all of those interventions, which one are you going to do first? Which one are you going to do second? Which one are you going to do third? And which one are you going to do fourth? And why? And lastly, guys, is evaluate outcome. You're going to compare what you're seeing now. So you did your nursing intervention for your patient. You're comparing what you see now with your patient with the expected outcome. So patient um, had, you gave the patient penicillin as ordered. They had an allergic reaction. We didn't know that patient was allergic to, um, I'm saying allergic, but let me take that back. They're having anaphylactic reaction. We didn't know that patient was allergic to uh, uh, penicillin. We're seeing that reaction. What are we going to do? Well, you know, we're going to give them epinephrine because the first thing we need to do is open that airways because it makes no sense to call the doctor while that patient <gasps> and they're dying, right? So we're going to make sure we open up that airway. We're going to make sure we give that, that patient that oxygen. We're going to make sure that they're sitting up. We're going to call the doctor, but you have to prioritize your action. And then when it comes to evaluate outcomes, what we're seeing with that patient is that the expected outcome, because if it's not, guess what? You're going back to the cues. So what is our expected outcome? Well, my expected outcome is that patient's going to be able to breathe. My expected outcome is that O2 sat goes back up. My expected outcome, if they went from turning blue to now turning pink again. Okay. So this is very important, guys. Um, these six are your clinical judgment, I don't know what to call them, clinical judgment things that they're gonna be testing you on. Recognizing cues, analyzing those cues, prioritizing your hypothesis, generating solution, taking action and evaluating outcome. Again, recognizing cues, that's your assessment. Can you figure out what's wrong? Analyzing cues, linking what's wrong with what you're about to do to help your patient prioritizing hypothesis that's prioritizing um the problem which problem is most important that we have to attack first generating solutions what we're going to do for that patient actually taking action and then evaluating the outcome so um let me make sure i didn't there was one more thing i want to tell you guys what was it one more thing i want to tell you about this exam It'll come to me. Um, so that's all I have for now, guys. I'm waiting on, again, like I said, I'm waiting on some more training. I've, I've put, asked some questions. I'm waiting to get answers on that. And hopefully I can get more to you on this NGN very soon. Again, guys, I'm not trying to scare you because guess what? NCLEX changed their exam back in... I think I'm lying on this. I want to say 2017, but I might be wrong. Was it? But anyway, they every you know good amount of years, six, seven years, they update, they update. So this is nothing new. So I'm not trying to scare you, but you do need to be prepared. And like I said, if you can take the test before this thing rolls out and you feel confident, do so. Don't be scared. But if you cannot, you have to take this NGN. Guess what, guys? Most of your exam is still the old NCLEX. There's only that 18U if, you know, it cuts off as soon as it can cut off. And that's what we're going for. So, guys, please, in the comment section, anything that I didn't cover that you want to know about, sound off in the comments because I'm trying to get as much information for you as possible. If you'd like to see a part two, uh, let me know. Let me know what you thought about this video. Again, guys, I'm so sorry. I can't share with you what I have, but as soon as I can get my hands on something that I can share with you without being sued, I'm going to do that. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope to hear from you in the comments and good luck on testing.